So the end of the golden era was caused by a supply cr side crisis. We needed some sort of supply side reforms. And the policies that were adopted uh, really centered on shifting the balance of power between employers and workers. So employers, especially uh, in the United States, kind of demanded uh, that union power, worker power, uh, was restrictive. Um, and nobody liked inflation, and so restrictive monetary policy was put in place to really bring down inflation. Uh, fiscal policy uh, was not used uh, as much to reduce unemployment, and so we had high unemployment and now lower inflation. Uh, and there were specific policies uh, put in place to weaken unions uh, in some countries, especially the United States uh, and the UK. Um, and so that reduced a worker's bargaining power as well. Um, in other countries, there were also cuts in unemployment benefits um, that, you know, changes that best response curve uh, for a worker. So the result was, you know, the great, the so-called great moderation, uh, which we had before the financial crisis, uh, which meant that productivity growth uh, really recovered, right? So it was pretty good in the 1980s. It was very strong in the 1990s, but real wages did not respond. And the reason for that was that workers simply didn't have the bargaining power that they had in the golden age era uh, and so couldn't demand higher wages. This was both because unions were weaker. It was also because of increased uh, trade to some extent, especially in the sort of post, uh, you know, mid 90s period. Um, and so wages really, I mean, wages basically stayed where they were in the 1970s, despite the fact that productivity uh, increased substantially. So problems with the Great Moderation um, that really led to the financial crisis, one was rising debt. We saw that in the first video in this chapter. Um, both households were taking on extra debt and financial firms were taking on extra debt. There was increasing house prices, right? So there was a, a, a big, an increase in supply of mortgages because there was a demand for these uh, mortgage-backed uh, securities, um, which made borrowing money much easier, which meant that the housing prices increased, right? Because demand for housing increased. Uh, and there was also a big increase in inequality, as we also saw in that first video, right? Where the share of income going to the top 1% went from about 8% in the mid-1970s all the way up to about 20% uh, before the financial crisis. So we had a lot of, you know, we talked about the Glass-Steagall Act, uh, which uh, regulated banks and other financial institutions after the Great Depression. And a lot of this debt and increase in inequality came about because we started getting rid of the Glass-Steagall Act, right? So there were lots of waves of financial deregulation, um, which you know, was not all bad. It allowed households to improve their consumption via borrowing, but it was not sustainable because they were not getting the higher income from uh, the increase in productivity. So we had basically a housing boom that was fueled by a financial accelerator, right? So remember that buying a house via a mortgage is when you, you borrow, you know, money, usually for, you know, up to 30 years, um, and it's a collateralized loan. So if you don't pay back the loan, then the bank takes the house. And the when when there's a housing bubble and the, the value of houses is going up and up, that allows firms to have more and more equity, which means they can borrow more, uh, which means that you know housing prices can go up further and sustain the bubble. And so it, it keeps going up and up. But the truth of any asset bubble, whether we're talking about you know stocks or tulips or houses, is that it's going to come down. And so this financial accelerator works on the way down as well. Price of housing falls. That means that we can't borrow as much. That means we can't consume as much. Uh, and the economy does poorly. So this is what we saw, right? We saw household debt to income ratio that was climbing. That's the blue line here. Um, and reached a peak in 2006. We saw a house pricing index that reached a peak in 2006 or 2007. Uh, and then started to fall. Um, and when that fell, that created a big problem for the financial institutions. Um, so there were a lot of borrowers who had borrowed um, that would not necessarily have had access to loans before. 
Um, and so there were, you know, subprime borrowers were the first ones to default on their loans, but they were by no means the only ones to default on their loans. In fact, default rates uh, were high sort of across the spectrum. Um, and, you know, the, the, the real sort of surprising thing was that basically everybody in the market was convinced that housing prices were going to keep going up. And they were convinced of it probably because their income and consumption depended on it. Right. Um, but when uh, housing prices are going up, that makes lending appear to be less risky. But of course, they're not going to go up forever. And so when they start to fall, you know, those risky loans are going to be the first ones to default. So what was going on? Well, we had a big increase in leverage, both in U.S. investment banks and in banks in the United Kingdom. We had a big demand for mortgage-backed securities and other collateralized debt obligations, CDOs and MBSs. Um, and so banks are getting highly leveraged, right? Which means that their, their liabilities and their assets are very close to each other. And so any fall in those assets is going to mean that uh, the banks are, uh, you know, out of business, right? That they are bankrupt. Uh, and that is, is eventually what we saw.